Hello, this is Jay Jennings, author and historian. Won't you join author, historian, and filmmaker Courtney Joyner and I as we present Professor Lampini's Podcast of Horrors, where we discuss all forms of classic horror films from the 1930s and 40s, including Universal, Poverty Row, and even the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes films. So turn down the lights and join us for Professor Lampini's Podcast of Horrors. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to another thrilling edition of Professor Lampini's Podcast of Horrors. I am Jay Jennings. And I'm Courtney Joyner. And for this episode, there's only one thing to say. Stop screaming. <laughs> hey, what? No meat? But uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll talk about those famous lines as we bring you our much-anticipated Rondo cast. Uh, we're fresh off the heels of our pilot episode where we discussed House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, George Zucco, uh, J. Carol Nash, and uh, the Castle Film Catalog. But today it's all about Rondo and uh, the, the four or five horror films he made, the appearances he made before that. And it's just he has left a legacy that is, is just indelible I mean, he has a cult following like that you wouldn't believe, Court. Uh, I mean, he's more popular now than I think he ever was. Oh, yeah. And, of course, we know his, his own life had a rather tragic streak, but also some wonderful things about it. Uh, but he didn't, unfortunately, pass away before almost all of the films he appeared in were released. Right. And, right, especially the, the last... The horror films. Yeah. Right, the last three, I think, horror films that... Uh, that he was known for, and we will be discussing those. Um, I'll be giving a review of all of his films, starting with uh, The Pearl of Death, that Sherlock Holmes film, of course, uh, Jungle Captive, uh, Sp The Return of the Spider Woman. It's not Return of the Spider Woman. It's, it's The Spider Woman Strikes Back. Thank you, Court. And uh, <laughs> House of Horrors, which is a personal favorite, and The Brute Man, which is almost, I don't think there's a better, better B double feature uh, uh, then uh, House of Horrors and The Brute Man. I mean, if you're feeling down and out, grab some popcorn and put those two on and you'll have a good time. But it did start uh, at a certain place. He, he always, uh, Rondo didn't always look like that. He was actually a very good looking guy. And we're going to discuss, I guess, his career and that, how he started. And uh, he yes, was... Well, the thing with, with Rondo Hatton, of course, there's always been, unfortunately, tremendous speculation about how he developed uh, acromegaly. And he was originally from Maryland, and his family relocated to Florida. And the thing was, he was a very handsome young man. He was an incredibly solid athlete uh, in high school and in college. And of course, this led to his interest in athletics led directly to his becoming a very prominent uh, sports writer in Florida and working for multiple newspapers. And he married uh, a young lady. And so life was good. And then he joined the army and was sent off to uh, France. And that's where he was the subject of a mustard gas attack that uh, hospitalized him. Of course, that stuff was just absolutely horrifying what it would do to the human body. And it was shortly after that that he developed all the symptoms of uh, acromegaly, which is the terrible disease which affects the pituitary gland. And doctors and everyone just, it's, they could not find any genetic links or any other reason that he was afflicted in this way. And especially later in his life, I mean, he was... It's very often this when this occurs there's there's hints of it in, during childhood and things like that but this just suddenly sprang on him and the only uh trigger with that anyone's ever been able to point to is the uh terrible experience he had in world war one uh suffering uh through that uh, gas attack right and i'm going to show a photo he actually was voted best looking boy was it in he high sure school was. or college i think i was in high school Okay, let's take a look at that. This is amazing. There's Rondo Hatton. When there he was he a young man, he looked distinguished. There are no, no forms of any bone disease or anything. And it's just, it's amazing. I wonder if, 
if he wouldn't have had that uh, suffered from that mustard gas, if he would have continued to look like this and live a little longer, Court. He he may have. I certainly the um, uh, the life expectancy I'm sure was damaged not just by the horrible disease and and all the terrible things that went with his illness, but uh, I'm sure also that uh, the gas attack itself would have impacted on his life expectancy. And but of course he had all these combination of illnesses and horrible afflictions kind of happening at once. And so, you know, his life was kind of turned upside down very quickly. Um, he continued to, he went back to writing uh, sports columns and was very successful and got very well known uh, in Florida for his reporting. Uh, but his appearance definitely had started to change. And his wife, uh, his w wife number one, left him. And so he was there with uh, this disfigurement kind of continuing for him. And then as a reporter, as we know, he was sent on an assignment and this would completely change his life when right. he was told to go and cover uh, the making of Hell Harbor. Right. Well, he was working for the Tampa Tribune, if I'm not mistaken, Court. That's right. Right. He was and he had a slew of un, non credited roles in a in a variety of films. Uh, I guess beginning with uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was his film debut. He played a slave. And then uh, his very next film, uh, we have a picture, is Hell Harbor. Now, how did he land that role, Court? Well, Hell Harbor happened because he was the reporter on set. And Henry King, the director, who was getting to be a pretty big guy. And he, he became a very prominent director at 20th Century Fox with 12 O'Clock High and Jesse James with Tyrone Power and all these wonderful movies. But he saw Rondo Hatton and said, well, look, you're going to be here anyway covering what we're doing. You should be the bartender. And so he put him in front of the camera. And later on, he just thought his presence was so interesting and significant that he encouraged Rondo Hatton to come to Hollywood, um, and which he did. He had married again to a very lovely girl, and she supported this decision. And, of course, he could have stayed as a reporter. The newspaper was extremely happy with his work, and they all liked him very much, but he decided to give Hollywood a crack because Henry King said, come on out here, kid. You know, with your mug, you'll make a fortune, or whatever it is he told him. And so he did. And of course, the initial period in, in Rondo Hatton's movie career was almost all of it was at 20th Century Fox, where Henry King was under contract and would put him in films like in old Chicago and Alexander's Ragtime Band and things like And then, of course, he would spin off into just extra work uh, in The Hunchback of Notre Dame with Charles Lawton. Right. Example. Well, we're going to show... Uh photos from all of those films. So he went on to be uncredited in a lot of films, a convict sitting on a floor in Captain Fury, uh, or the, played the big guy. Uh, in, in, in The Big Guy, he played a convict. In Moon Over Burma, he played a sailor. All uncredited, but if you have these movies or you rent them and you look for him, you could pause it and you could actually see him in the background. I mean, he does Absolutely. stand out, as we'll talk and about. All 20th Century Fox. Oh, okay. So he, uh, talking about an old Chicago with uh, Ty Power, uh, he actually has a great scene uh, with him in old Chicago. Talk about that scene, Court. Well, th that's a, that was the thing that this was a, this was a real moment in the movie. And it wasn't just Rondo being used for, if you will, visual salt and pepper in the background. And uh, to, he has a real moment with Ty Power. Now, of course, the thing is, uh, with the acromegaly, it also affected his vocal cords. So he had that very hoarse voice that was very significant. And you see these two together. You couldn't ask for a more amazing visual uh, contrast, and, uh, which right. I think is exactly what, uh, what they wanted. And we were discussing before the show, Rondo really wasn't that tall. No, uh, he was not. They had to give him lifts to uh, make him, you know, when he does his creeping, 
Uh, and so because you saw in that photo right there, he was almost half of Ty Power's uh, size. And, and Tyrone Power was not some giant. So the, the fact that Rondo's head and his hands and everything were completely out of proportion with the rest of his body uh, had to be disguised. And certainly during his universal period, the padded suits and the heavy asphalt spreader shoes and all the rest of these tricks that they used to make him appear as large as possible as either the Hoxton creeper or the New York creeper or who Mario, the monster man who, right. who whoever he was playing. But uh, there are moments, I think in every one of those movies where you kind of go, wait a minute, how big is this guy? He looks about six, eight, 300 pounds with the yep. biggest shoulders you've ever seen. So in, in Hunchback of Notre Dame, he was given a nice kind of little bit. I guess they were doing who's the the ugliest uh, guy contest, right? That's right. Quasimodo That's for the, uh, for the King of Fools uh, sequence. Right. And I mean, and, and, and there he is. There he and is. And it's just, you figure who's uglier than that? Of course, it's Quasimodo. <laughs> Yes, uh, Charles Lawton wearing a remarkable makeup created for him uh, by the Westmores. And uh, there's Rondo Hatton without makeup. Right. That's a great, great, great scene. So as I said, more, uh, more bit roles came where, as I said, Rondo was uncredited. Uh, Chad Hanna, he played a canvasman. It happened in Flatbush. You, you'll miss him if you blink. He plays a baseball game spectator in Tales of Manhattan. Uh, he's a party guest in the Fields sequence. So yep. if you, you know, you miss it. Sin Town, he's a townsman. The Moon and Sixpence, he plays a leper. <laughs> so Yes, he does. Right. And uh, with uh, with absolutely stunning work in that movie from Elena Verdugo. Oh, yeah, of course. Then and then we have, and you'll show your lobby card after I show the photo. Uh, he is in the Oxbow incident. Uh, with Henry Fonda. He's in the background. I'll show you the photo that I have. I circle him, circle him out. Not really a big part by any stretch, but you have a, a lobby card that's even, that even shows a, him more clearer. Yes, uh, and here it is. Oh, well, let, me, let me get the full let's shot. Let's see. Let's get the full shot. There we go. There, there he is go. standing with his arms... Uh, folded and one of these days i will actually master this technique well that's good right there just don't move <laughs> okay there we are yep so i mean he was he was so even though he'd be uncredited or would have a small role these were still major motion pictures at the time not like he was making it's not like he started off making b movies he was in studio no, pictures not at all and look at who he was direct uh working with he was working with henry king he was working with william wellman he was working with uh william diderley and henry hathaway they, these were not the throwaway guys and uh then he ended up going over to universal and i believe his first appearance there was in a uh serial oh okay i believe it was northwest mounted police maybe if if that's correct and then, and, and then I guess right after that, he began his universal uh, career. And what a g better way to, to start it off, Court, uh, than in The Pearl of Death, one of the great Sherlock Holmes movies uh, with Basil Rathbone. I think we have the, uh, I'll put it in the middle of us. I think I have the, uh, the lobby. There we go. So yeah, which this is, is he's on the poster, which is fantastic, or the lobby card. And, you know, this is, it's kind of interesting that the character of the Hoxton Creeper, created by Bertram Milhauser, who wrote quite a few of the Sherlock Holmes movies. He wrote Sherlock Holmes Faces Death, Sherlock Holmes in Washington, and a number of others. And he, uh, he was a really fine uh, screenwriter. But there's always been that kind of question as to whether or not he was aware of Rondo Hatton when he created this character. I don't think he was. I, I think that they he wrote this thinking they would find someone. You know, George Johnson was, you know, starting to appear in films at this point. So he could have been the Hoxton Creep. I mean, there were plenty of people around who uh, could have filled this role, and it became Rondo Hatton. And in order, you know, Jay, for Rondo to make this movie, 
once again, it's like, okay, he's got this incredible face, this great presence, but Rathbone describes him as having the chest of a buffalo and the arms of a gorilla and all these things. Uh, no, absolutely not. So all that we're seeing here in that great image uh, is padding. Right. right like a, and he was wearing football. elevator shoes and right. all this stuff. And in fact, as we know, Basil Rathbone was taller than he was. Right, like a football player. Um, anyway, also let's yep. not mention the beautiful, 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 uh, one of the early queens of horror. Uh, Evelyn Ankers is in this film. Oh, what's her great line? Go on, you old bag of grease. Wash your own dishes. <laughs> she smashes the plate. Yep. Right. And great. Uh, she's great in this movie because they give her all these different things to do because she's trying to find where the pearl has been hidden in the bust of Napoleon. And so she's the girl with a poor eyesight working for Ian Wolfe in the antique store. And she's the brassy dishwasher and all kinds of things. And, of course, yeah. Rondo Hatton is in love with her. They try to ugly her up, which do I, which is a tough thing to do. Um, they give her glasses. Oh, no, she and, just looks spectacular. Right, and I think they try to blot out one of her teeth. Um, you're right, Ian Wolfe is also in this film as well. Um, and Char Miles Mander right, as Charles Francis. Just that sleazy, horrible uh, crime boss. Uh, and I think that was also Bertram Milhauser. Uh, of course, they were working from the uh, Conan Doyle story, The Six Napoleons. But I think that Universal also wanted to kind of introduce this one did not have anything to do with Nazis, which many of the World War II ones did, of course. But I think they wanted to introduce alternate villains to Professor Moriarty. Kind of like a comic And so book. it w yeah. wouldn't always be Holmes versus Moriarty. So right. Giles Conover. And then uh, here's my play. this is my favorite still from the from the film court. There you go. Love that. And of course, uh, Holmes talks his way out of it as he always does. <laughs> you know, no one else could. The the idea of Rondo Hatton uh, performing murders for somebody else. And then a, a, a potential victim saying, don't you know you're being made a fool of? Don't you know that you're the one who's going to hang? And all this type of stuff always gets him. He always turns on his master every single time, uh, whatever you, you use that strategy. Right. So I always kept that in mind in case I ran into him. Well, well, that's the strategy he uh, Holmes uses at the end of a lot of movies uh, yes. where he tells... Um, when he faces death, he goes, oh, you killers are all egomaniacs. You get them, start talking, and they'll, they'll blather everything. Which was written by Bertram Milhouse. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And uh, one of the things that's a little unusual about Pearl of Death, other than uh, just that it's one of the best Sherlock Holmes movies, is uh, Rathbone describes the death of Dr. Watson, and it's really horrific that uh, Evelyn Ankers picks up a pair of shears and stabs him in the throat and he bleeds to death and all of this stuff. I mean, you know, of course, they would never show something like that, but Rathbone describes it uh, pretty literally. And you're like, wow, wait, that's, that's pretty well, like rough stuff. Probably ended, I wonder if they shot that and it ended up on the cutting room floor. Holmes, I'm, <laughs> I'm bleeding to death like a, like a dirty pig. But... Um, Anyway, so let's move on to the to the next film that Rondo appeared in. Uh, he's basically, in a lot of these films, he's always either, as you said, he's working for somebody, taking orders from somebody. And here it's from Otto Kruger, correct, uh, Court? Yep, Jungle Captive. Right. And what do you want? You wanted to show something real quick? Or what sure. do you got? Hold on. There we go. That's, there we go. And, and what's funny is that's the same photo of Rondo from Pearl of Death. Yes. And oh, there we go. Cool. Moloch the now, Brute. The, um, the female lead of this, Emma Ward, was, uh, she was married to uh, Bernard Gorsi. Or excuse me, she, that's her was her father-in-law. She was married to Leo Gorsi of the Bowery Boys. And her romantic uh, interest in this, Phil Brown, 
of course, was Luke Skywalker's uncle in Star Wars. Uncle Luke. Uncle Luke. Aunt Varun. Yep. yep. <laughs> wow. And uh, now that that is Vicky Lane, who was the very beautiful model. In fact, she was married to Tom Neal, who co-starred with Rondo in The Brute Man. And uh, she took the place of uh, Aquanetta, who had been playing Paula the Ape Woman up until this movie, which was the third sequel, and uh, directed by Harold Young, who directed The Mummy's Tomb. Right. And it's funny, he's wearing a suit, he's dignified. He's not always this um, caveman-like type of killer. In some of these films, he's very smart, as he is in the Spider-Woman's uh, uh, Revenge. Strikes back, yeah. Strikes back. And I'm going to get that right one of these days. Well, and also, I think the thing in Jungle Captive, he has a lot of screen time. Yeah, he does. And which, uh, and he has he has a great deal to do. And when we again we talk about Rondo Hatton's physicality, and of course, your eye goes immediately to him in any shot that he's in. But he and Otto Kruger are like the same height. Well, look at this. Look at this shot here. <laughs> yeah, with Otto Kruger actually standing on the steps above him. So they were always, I think, that struggle because they wanted him to be as physically menacing as uh, as possible. Right, and even, um, when, uh, even during the um, the surgery uh, scene or the transfusion scene. Yep. And uh, and of course. Uh, our favorite actor from uh, who's the guard in the House of Frankenstein. Yep. Uh, Charles Wagenheim. Charles Wagenheim was very frequently the victim of Rondo Hatton because he was shorter than he was. So they would cast him. He is in this movie as the coroner who gets killed. He uh, so this was something they always had to kind of compensate for. And they were always thinking about is let's uh, let's find somebody smaller than Rondo. Because look here, Phil Brown looks like he's taller than Rondo is. Right. Look, he can barely get his arms around. See, see, without the big yep. padding and kind of like the football shoulders, uh, he's just a regular guy. And his, Absolutely. Uh, and his face doesn't look that bad. Maybe it just got worse in the next couple of years as, as the films, you know, it helped him and look more And of course, sinister. you know, I'm sure also that, you know, they accentuated things via Jack Pierce. And uh, of course, Phil Brown, uh, before he was blacklisted and he was under contract to Universal, he is the young student that uh, Lon Chaney accidentally shoots in Weird Woman. Oh, yeah. And then later on uh, in some great movies uh, when he went to Europe, like Valdez is coming with Burt Lancaster. And uh, there is Mrs. Tom Neal and Rondo and Otto Kruger. And again, we don't want to keep harping on this, but uh, there's Rondo shorter than anybody else in the shot. I wonder if that was... She's a sitting up on a table. I wonder if that's intentional or not. I got one more shot to show kind of a famous shot of him looking down. That's kind of like his famous signature look, like before he breaks someone's back, yep. you know? So, but I mean, that's what makes him Rondo. I mean, there's only one Rondo. Well, and one thing too, from the uh, personal side of uh, the Rondo Hatton's biography is during this period, and he was actually had some solid income coming in from the movies and he was uh he was obviously universal was trying to build him uh a little bit is he was very dedicated to helping and counseling veterans who were coming home from the pacific theater of war who had had uh facial traumas so he was doing that as well as appearing uh in these horror films Oh, that's that's really good to know. Because you, quick plug, you did a little uh, documentary on Rondo yourself a little while back, right, Court? Well, it was Daniel Griffith, yes, and I was able to step in and and uh, help with that one, and uh, it was uh, wonderful. It was on the uh, uh, Shout Factory uh, Universal Horrors uh, release of was that Shout or Kino? 
that terrible? I can't. Now I can't remember. Oh my gosh! You work for so uh, many. Clubs. I think actually, I think it was Kino uh, when they did the Universal Horrors and House of Horrors and Night Monster and Night Key and the Climax. Were all oh, the, okay. The oh, that's a great triple bill right there. So then his next horror film, his next foray into horror, uh, was The Spider-Woman Strikes Back with the great uh, Gail Sondergaard. And he is featured once again prominently uh, in the advertisements as he is in, in this lobby card. As Mario the Monster Man. And he's, he's always green, isn't he? <laughs> yes. And the thing was, to by this time, Universal... The studio was getting ready to be sold. They were burning through contracts uh, from everybody who was uh, had been there, primarily in B films or whatever. Here you're seeing Kirby Grant and Brenda Joyce and Milburn Stone, uh, Arthur Lubin, who had directed Black Friday, but was primarily known, of course, for Abbott and Costello and the beautiful color version of Fan of the Opera with Claude Rains. He directed this. And it, it really is a quickie, although it has a wonderful uh, fire sequence at the end. But the plot of the uh, creation of plants that need to be fed blood and what have you, it gets a little confusing as the spider woman is actually victimizing the uh, cattle population of the ranchers around her. Uh, but one of the wonderful things in this movie is Gail Sondergaard plays half the film as if she's blind. And in fact, she is not. Her character is supposed to be. She's uh, pulling a scam on everybody. But she does such a beautiful job. It's a wonderful. It's also one of the last things that uh, the great Brenda Joyce did before she retired from the movies and uh, went off to produce uh, community theater, which was actually her first love. So uh, she awesome. ended her period at Universal with That's that film. Very Got some kind of vampire uh, overtones, vampiric or vampiric overtones, as you mentioned earlier. And uh, there's Brenda. Yep, very menacing uh, scene as always. And that was, I think, great thing about these lobby cards uh, and and window cards and kind of the smaller paper ephemera. They always featured lots of very co cool scenes within the film, as well as you know, film uh, shots that weren't in the film, but. Seems like the ones Rondo is in, it tells a story. All the lobby cards he's in, you kind of, oh, I remember that scene, or, oh, yeah, I remember that. I mean, a lot of films don't have that. I'm just making a side comment about how some of these, uh, I guess, lobby cards of the time actually tell a story, if we're fortunate enough to have them, Court, because they're all 10, 20, 30 grand each. <laughs> Well, <laughs> the thing is, too, with uh, with lobby cards from this period, and this continued on into the 1960s, lobby cards were posed. Uh, set photographers took still images, and they were either culled from the still photographs from the movie or specifically uh, done as uh, separate photo shoots. These were not frame blow-ups, which became later on the uh, the norm for lobby cards, and then they discontinued lobby cards completely, really, overall. But uh, this was uh, the way that they did it. They had the actors, and a photographer was there, and click. So that's why I think also th that uh, there's some sort of real visual panache to lobby cards, certainly from the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Well, you know, as you know, that that's kind of something that really is not the norm anymore no no last thing well about I, I just wanted to yeah. mention one thing with spider woman strikes back is the uh again as universal was kind of shutting things down the ben pivar unit had been the one of the great sources of universal horror project pr product they were the second tier it was under george wagner or even paul malvern but Ben Pivar's unit produced the Cheney Kairos movies. They produced the Inner Sanctum movies. They produced the Paul of the Ape Woman movies. Uh, the Mad Ghoul, which is just absolutely wonderful. And so, and tons of mysteries. And then he, he was in charge of all these westerns and adventure films and everything else. The Rondo Hatton movies, not the Spider Woman Strikes Back, but. House of Horrors, which we're going to get to, Brute Man, all, all of these came under the Ben Pivar unit. Uh, he was the producer 
for all the second tier uh, horror that Universal made. So let's move on to, I guess, this is uh, the piece de resistance um, we've been waiting for, one of my all-time favorite horror films of all time. And of course, um, Martin Koslick, we call him Marty, uh, has one of the great <laughs> names of all time, Marcel Delange. Uh, it's just one of the great names of all time. Uh, I, I, maybe I should change my name to that. Uh, or <laughs> we should all change our name to Martin Koslick movie characters. Right, right. But uh, we're going to get into this in detail. I've got a lot of great photos to show. Courtney's going to give us um, uh, his take on the film. And um, it's just a great film all around. The, the murder scenes, some good-looking actresses are in this film. And Accord will talk about that. So uh, I'll start with the photos. And uh, first off, who directed House of Horrors, uh, Court? Gene Yarborough. He directed every episode of the Abbott Costello wow. show. He he was absolutely a comedy specialist. Oh, by the way, we, we are talking about House of Horrors. And uh, it he was just, he was a utility guy at Universal. Uh, got going with Abbott and Costello, uh, Here Come the Co-Eds. He directed uh, the naughty nineties, and he was. Um, Didn't he do again, Devil Bat would, too? Poor Devil Bat. He sure did direct the Devil Bat, and interestingly, the Devil Bat script was written by George Bricker, the great scenarist and uh, mystery writer who wrote the script for House of Horrors based on Dwight Babcock's story. Wow. So uh, there was all kind of again all this inter. Uh, uh, how would you say interconnections uh, from the uh, from Poverty Row over to Universal and maybe beyond it? But Gene Yarbrough uh, was responsible for House of Horrors. He was responsible for the Brute Man. He was responsible for She Wolf of London. And by the way, all three movies sharing the same writing team, and all three movies. Uh, produced by Ben Pivar. Right. Thank, as we said, good good for him. So let me give a little uh, plot background because this was our kind of main feature that we're taking a look at. Uh, struggling uh, sculptor uh, played by Marty Koslick. Marcel uh, plays Marcel Delange. He's de depressed about his current state of, uh, of his sculpting. He's not really successful. So he's going to go to the dock and commit suicide. But just as he's about to kill himself, he sees this you know, guy called the Creeper, Rondo, in the process of drowning. And he takes and he, and he saves him and uh, takes him under his care. And um, I have a scene here, hopefully. Hold on. There we are. And um, he, you know, he gets him back and he, he shows him, he makes him the, the subject of his next sculpture. And he, he it's my best creation, <laughs> Marcel Delage says. And... Um, and when critics uh, denigrate Marcel's work, he basically has the creeper uh, kill, the, kill them. You didn't like the guy? And uh, it's, it's brilliant in the screenwriting. Well, let me show you another script of how he, he takes care of, care of him. You are my you're friend. My own, you're my friend. Right. Yep. He goes, I hope so, because if otherwise, we're going to have problems. But uh, anyway, it's just he, he befriends him, and they discuss over a meal of uh, cheese and bread, with the, um, wait, wait for a court, don't say it yet. Uh, with, the <laughs> with the famous line, we can say at the same time, no meat. No meat. <laughs> but we can't afford meat because no, nobody's yes. going to buy my artwork. And, for this uh, man, we would have food and light and wine. So right, and, and, and as he's- You gotta kill Alan Napier. Right, he puts all these ideas, it's just a great series of scenes where Marty puts all these ideas into his head, like if it wasn't for these you know, certain critics, he'd be able to eat normally and I'd be able to pet my cat. And, uh, and it's so funny, the, the way the camera travels where uh, Marty is talking about how bad things are and, uh, and then the camera shows uh, Rondo sculpting clay. It's just such an odd scene. And it just shows his big hands. Now, this is what you're talking about, Court, where his shoulders are padded. This is what the creeper looks like. This is what a, this yep. is what he's famous for. This is the epitome of, of who he plays. And it's probably, his obviously, his greatest role. 
and also you can see here particularly in this still uh how slender his waist was right so yeah there is a real contrast there i mean that is all uh padding and and fill underneath and oh you know, jay with this movie of course with rondo going about and oh the fantastic uh moment where he just can't not fight his urges and he kills virginia christine who is spectacular in her very small role as the streetwalker oh she st she steals the uh, scene let me get her up on the screen she really does oh my gosh well well joan fulton that was uh before before she got married and uh she was very tall she's over six feet tall and what happened with her was and she got tremendous reviews for house of horrors everyone's saying my gosh this girl is the one to look for uh because she's very funny she was so beautiful uh but she had a baby and gained a little weight that she never really lost but it ha she then becomes this magnificent wise cracking mother figure and i think if anyone knows her today not just because she's so wonderful in this film but she changed her name uh is she is the leader of the all-girl orchestra and some like it hot oh, okay and then later on of course was maury amsterdam's wife pickles on the dick van dyke show Virginia Christine with her cigarette. And it just drops out. Get away from me. Don't talk to me. Yep. Get away from me. And then the famous line, stop yelling. <laughs> but I always thought the, the afterwards, you had a little image from that of uh, the murder. And Martin Koslick has this line. I have often wondered why a man would want to break a woman's back. I've often wondered. Where where does that come from? That's a, I don't know if he ad libbed that, but that's a great line. Yeah, um, she screamed. So yeah, okay. Yes, an annoying habit on the part of women. It's like I don't think I guess that these kind guys of screenwriting really right friends. Uh, yes, would get along. And, uh, in this, but anyway, Virginia Gray is also in it as the uh, over curious news uh, newspaper reporter, and she um, there she is. She asks a lot of questions. Uh, I guess she wants to know where the creepier is. Obviously, she recognizes the face. Um, and, you know, Martin I, uh, wants to get rid uh, Marcel wants to get rid of her. And uh, doesn't care how beautiful she is. And, of course, then you get that Beauty and the Beast thing where he orders um, the, uh, the creeper Rondo to kill her. And he doesn't want to, but I don't want to jump ahead of ourselves. Let's get to the murder of uh, the critic played by Alan Napier with the great scene where he's there and he's like, I call it Circe's of Toil. I call it tripe. <laughs> and that's, of course, Alfred from Batman. And he's also in Macbeth. Alan Napier is all over the place in the, in the 40s and 50s. Oh, gosh. Uh, the Uninvited and uh, Premature Burial for Roger right. Corman. Rondo gets up on there cue. You go. Gets, grabs his jacket off the rack, and off he goes. You don't like the guy. <laughs> well, this film. one, my guess is because uh, Joan Charlie was so tall that uh, Rondo is probably standing on a box. And what she is doing, if you notice with her hands, which a uh, number of people who had worked with Rondo Hatton had said that this was a way to like force physical action out of him because he was physically, he was being eaten alive by this terrible disease. So he couldn't, he, he could do physical things, but throwing people around and fight scenes and everything like that, the person who was being thrown around actually had the physical responsibility of selling the scene, not Rondo Hatton. Right, absolutely. And there he is with his famous pose. And anyway, so he goes, um, Near the end of the end of the film, uh, Marty Koslick tells him, "Well, you have to kill, you have to kill her. I ain't killing her. I'm killing you." So well, uh, he kills well she she pulls the old, uh, you know, you. He, if, he's he's if, the one pulling if, your strings. He's the one. He's gonna get famous with a sculpture of your head and all this stuff, and he's gonna get rich, and you're gonna get hung. Wait a minute, you're supposed to be my friend, and then of course. Uh, killing i love by the way one of the things in house of horrors is murray gortzman's uh photography is wonderful 
And the film has a really kind of elegant look to it, even though it's all the universal backlot and uh, the old uh, harbor set, all these things have since been long demolished. But Gene Yarbrough goes for long pans and long tracking shots and lots of fog and lots of wet. And it really gives the film, a, if you will, an elevated feel than just something that was shot in 12 days for the Ben Pivar unit. And there was also those wonderful behind-the-scenes shots with uh, Virginia Gray and uh, Bob Lowry, and they're doing the flip a cigarette into your mouth game and what have you. Right. And there's Rondo Hatton, and he's chatting away with everybody and just having a, a lovely time. He was uh, so th that's always been kind of the, a bit of the tragedy because his screen presence is so odd. But here he was just a very nice guy and he was doing this work and to make money and that was it. And he had a good relationship with all the people that he worked with. Here was probably Martin Koslick's ultimate star turn, certainly at Universal, long before the Flesh Eaters and those things in the 1960s. But Ben Pivar believed in Marty Koslick because he had him in The Frozen Ghost, The Inner Sanctum Mystery. He has him in uh, House of Horrors. He uh, also has him in She-Wolf of London. So uh, Koslick was being used over and over and over again by this one producer who said, no, this guy could, I guess, actually be another horror name because they were trying to figure out a universal at this time what do we do to replace the frankenstein monster and the wolf man and these other things the contracts were ending lon cheney was leaving the studio boris karloff was only there under a special contract he was long gone so there's all kinds of if you will turmoil that was going on in the front office while these movies were were being made right. and new decisions had to be made you know, when International Pictures, as J. Arthur Rank, bought Universal or partnered with them, first thing they did was Hamlet with Laurence Olivier. And they wanted to push Universal away from the B pictures, away from the old mysteries and the everything else, and particularly away from Abbott and Costello. Uh, and then just really to get out from under, they make Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and it's their biggest hit. So Universal kind of international now slides on back and Francis the Talking Mule and Mom Pa Kettle and then the William Allen uh, science fiction movies. But at the same time, they were doing the big Douglas Sirk melodramas and Jeff Chandler and Rock Hudson and Tony Curtis and all this stuff all, all simultaneously. Right. And very much, again, trying to elevate themselves uh, beyond where they were in the uh, 1940s. So let's talk about um, uh, Rondo's last film, The Brute Man. And it's got an interesting backstory. I'm going to show some photos. There we go. And there's, is this Jane? Uh, That's Adams. Jane Adams, yeah. Right, right, blind Jane Adams playing her piano. Absolutely. Right. So let's move, as we go on to uh, The Brute Man, and I'll give a little background about it. And then Court will give his uh, take on it. It was a 1946 uh, film. Rondo as the Creeper. Well, he can't get away from it. And he uh, seeks revenge against the people he holds responsible for his disfigurement. Directed once again by the great Gene Yarborough and Tom Neal uh, from Detour. Jane Wiley, Jan Wiley. Uh, they're a married uh, couple. And the pair of friends of the creeper blames for his deformities that's kind of a weird thing yeah you're the reason why and then of course jane adams plays the blind pianist whom uh, tries to uh, the creeper tries to help raise money so she could restore her vision what makes this interesting is i start showing uh some uh photos from this and some uh, lobby cards uh here's the first one uh, this was, as we talked, Universal Pictures was uh, near the end of their horror film period. And uh, the result of its pending merger with International Pictures, uh, Universal basically adapted a policy against releasing uh, any more B-movies, as we discussed. So what's interesting is they sold uh, The Creeper 
uh, or the brute, the brute man, for 125 grand to Poverty Road uh, to PRC, which then distributed the film uh, without any mention <laughs> of Universal's involvement. This is a very famous story that it's, it's already made. It's full of lore and it's 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 epic if for a lot of uh, researchers and uh, historians and. Uh, no mention of in the publicity or the credits that this was ever a universal film and it, uh, it had various titles over the years and while it was being circulated at the time of the merger and i guess uh, most people think court that universal simply found the uh, exploitative nature uh, since rando had died and his deformity i mean this was the third film this third that they made his you can see his demise was being foreshadowed in his acting of course and it was, it, the story was kind of poorly developed and it might be detrimental to its corporate image. What, what do you remember reading about that? Well, here's, here's the deal with, with all of this. So um, the reality was that William Getz and all those guys sat down and they looked at the completed movies. They were getting ready to pink slip everybody uh, from the Ben Pivar unit anyway. And they said, no, uh, we can't say we're going to be changing our image and then release a movie like this, although they did release a few more mystery films. So they uh, Hatton was dead. They thought the movie was in very bad taste to exploit that. So they sold it to PRC, as you said. But of course, other than chopping off, and I have a lobby, used to have a lobby card, by the way, from the Brute Man as Universal. Hmm. And uh, so publicity materials, all that stuff, when you look at that half sheet, which I do own, it's in the living room, uh, and you see that thing, PRC Pictures, that's a that's a snipe over the Universal Presents. So the other factor being here, and I don't know if these guys were that aware of it, is that the parallels in this story to Rondo Hatton's real life were truly evident. And George Bricker and Dwight Babcock knew about Hatton's background, knew he had been a athlete, knew all of this stuff, and affected by gas, in his case, in the battlefield in World War I. Here, it's in a college laboratory he's exposed to gas, and this is what turns him into uh, this uh, disfigured man. So there are so many parallels to his real life in this story. Everybody seemed, uh, I think, very aware of it. And I think also Gene Yarborough was trying to protect Rondo a little bit in the way that he shot him. Uh, Jane Adams had told us that uh, he really was deteriorating very fast, that he had terrible difficulty remembering the very few lines that he had. And they had to kind of take him by the hand, uh, walking him through everything. And also, uh, it was around this time that he had a, a heart attack and he was incoherent and didn't didn't know where he was or who he was and all of these terrible things were all happening at once and so it really was a matter of let's get this thing done uh quickly because uh rondo hatton is unfortunately going to uh leave us very soon and he did right and uh, but it was a re it was a real struggle for him but everyone seemed very sympathetic to his plight uh, and here he is, of course, behind, behind uh, Tom Neal, who had his own personal issues, to put it mildly, and ended up going to prison for shooting his wife in the head. Right. I was going to say, what makes this film interesting, as I said, I love watching this as a double feature, because it's, kind of uh, it's kind of a quasi prequel to House of Horrors. Uh, mm -hmm. He play, kind of still plays a deformed madman, named the Creeper, and he breaks people's backs. Um, What's interesting is I was reading some things. It's kind of true uh, in a way, if you think about it. It kind of has a little touch of um, uh, City Lights uh, in that uh, he's in love with a blind girl and he seeks money for the operation to uh, restore her sight. And there's a little bit of dialogue that's very similar between the monster and kind of like the blind hermit uh, in Bride of Frankenstein. So there's kind of some weird... Uh, uh, I guess analogies to, to, to those films. He, he finds a companion in, in a blind loner 
who knows nothing about his deformities. So is, mm-hmm. that, is that kind of right to see it? It kind of has touches of earlier films, Court? Oh, I, I think so. You know, Bricker and Babcock were, these guys knew how to write this stuff. They were so familiar with it. Uh, and Dwight Babcock, Dwight Babcock, was from Black Mask magazine, and you could not ask for a more elevated forum for a crime writer than that. That's Raymond Chandler and Lovecraft and everybody, really something. And Bricker very often would write the scripts. Now, these guys also wrote The Mummy's Curse, and they wrote Dead Man's Eyes, The Inner Sanctum. They wrote Pillow of Death, The Inner Sanctum. They would continue with the Pivar unit to do She-Wolf of London. So they were grinding out these pages as probably as quickly as they could. And again, with Rondo Hatton, I'm sure there's an element of the ticking clock. And what do we do? And the idea of him having some sort of a interrelationship with a girl would have been so different than literally everything else where all he's doing is walking around murdering these women. So I think they wanted to shift and get away from that. And plus two, you know, I mean, Rondo Hatton was happy to do whatever was required of him, but also in his real life, he was he was married. Right. You know, what's funny about also this film, Court, it's got some noirish qualities uh, that we would be remiss of you to mention. Murray Getzman, who was the DP, Director of Photography, uh, he focused, uh, you know, since the film, you know, focused on a disfigured serial killer, he gave it a very dark kind of diseased look appropriate for the subject matter and the urban setting used... As he did with House of Horrors. Right, uh, the shadowed lighting, unbalanced compositions, uh, contrast between light and dark. So the Brute Man has been dismissed as like a cheap B-thriller, but no, 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 no. It's a great little noirish film that is much better than, uh, I guess, the bad rap it's gotten. Well, also, too, I think one of the reasons the bad rap really got going with it is that the movie fell into the public domain. So there were tons of cheapo copies of it around and everything else, and it just it wasn't being seen in its best best light at all. Right. So, but in a whole, it just and then of course, uh, 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 Rondo passed away a, a year earlier, so he wasn't able to see these films be released, which is very odd. Usually yep. a star will maybe see his films and then, you know, pass away from some illness or uh, something. But to pass away after making your three best films and never being able to see them, I just can't get it through my head. What a, It's just so weird. It's so, it's shocking. Um, I mean, imagine if that happened now. Well, it did happen, but not really. I mean, the, the guy who made the, the Black Panther passed away, but he lived to see it and he enjoyed the accolades. And then, unfortunately, he passed away. But to make a two or three films court and then and then pass before they come out is just it's 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 terrible. No, it, it is terrible. It was really just another, unfortunately, tragic element to his life story. But also, too, you've got to remember, Universal didn't consider Rondo Hatton a star. They weren't going to make any special accommodations for him at all. Uh, we paid you. Go see the movie when it opens at your local Bijou. That I, that's was all they cared about. Right. And so the uh, the fact that uh, that he didn't have a chance to see any. I I think he may have seen Pearl of Death. I certainly hope so. Yeah. But um, nope. Everything else. Mm-mm, he didn't live long enough. And that. Uh, in our little uh, Doc Bay, Ted Newsom brings up a very uh, solid point is that Universal really put this guy to work. These uh, Spider Woman Strikes Back, House of Horrors, The Brute Man, Pearl of Death. I mean, just one right after the other. Boom, 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 boom. Possibly, they, they possibly contributed to his early death, maybe. All that over. It may. It may very well have, yeah, and um, but he unfortunately he definitely was deteriorating, and uh, but it was also very nice when speaking to Jane Adams or that everybody was uh, very cognizant and sympathetic to that, although she, you know, working with him was a was a trial because he just couldn't get the lines and he would get confused and what have you because. Uh, Sadly, his illness was 
progressing to that point where it was really affecting him. Do you see a, a parallel to this a similar way? I mean, I wouldn't say they had a... I th- I think Rondo is a much better actor and had a greater presence. But I see a kind of a similarity between Rondo and, and, and Tor Johnson. Kind of like bigger than life character. When they're on the screen, they steal the whatever scene they're in, no matter who they're with. I mean, Tor grunted and groaned more and, and patted on the pretty girl. But hey, uh, Time for it to go to bed. Right, time for it to... Oh, it is late. But... Um, <laughs> What do you think about that? Is that kind of a fair assessment? They're both very similar in their cult status? Well, the, the thing is, I, I don't think that's that's wrong. I think, uh, of course, unfortunately, Tor Johnson is better known now for the things with Ed Wood, even than, uh, say, he would be for a movie like The Black Sleep. Right. But, again, he was hired because of his physical presence. And he's in... Bob Hope movies and all kinds of things, just like Rondo Hatton was in all those A pictures of 20th Century Fox. So these are guys who are visual presences. That's why they wanted them. And whether they could say dialogue or not, or hit their marks or not, and of course they learned and they ultimately did fine. And also, too, Tor Johnson, of course, had a very thick Swedish accent. Right. So I'm a big boy now, Johnny. You know, all that stuff. And he was a little difficult to understand. So, but uh, I, I would say, I would see parallels, although Rondo was, in fact, taken under the guidance of a real movie studio Absolutely. to try and build his career. Yeah. Toro was just, I guess, an ex-wrestler who had great features mm-hmm. and looks and would play the henchman to people like sure. Carradine, Lugosi, and stuff like that. But we had to mention that because it's, it's it's so obvious. I think they had uh, uh, had a similar kind of path, but one was, I think, a better actor and had more of a presence. But they're both incredible cult to, as of today. Both have incredible cult status. Uh, who's anything that de- that has them a lobby card, a poster, an autograph? What's that? Oh, wait a minute! <laughs> wait a there minute. you go. You surprised me. Stop yelling. Yep. That's great, Court, because I was going to actually, I was going to show uh, something similar to that, but you beat me, you beat me to it. Wait a minute, let me let me see if I can put it up there. There it is. Oh, that's <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, a friend of mine had one of these back in the day. They're very hard to find. These are made custom made by individual, you know, painters and sculptors who work on their own. They're not subsidized by a company and they make these one-offs so something like this would sell for fifteen hundred two thousand dollars on ebay yeah i I forget who did this rondo figure but it's like a sideshow thing and uh it's um no they did a very they did a very nice job that's an awesome job but the the thing is say when you brought up tor johnson tor johnson ended up being a halloween mask from don post Right. And so anything connected with Rondo Hatton, like a, a figure or a model kit or anything like that, that was real specialized stuff. They didn't even bring out, like, say, a figure of him when the Rocketeer came out and Rick Baker did that wonderful makeup job and what have you. And, uh, well, Jay, I've told you that right after I got out of college, I worked on a movie biography of Rondo Hatton uh, at Universal. It was to be a TV movie. They wanted to do basically a TV version of The Elephant Man. And I co-wrote it with a fantastic writer. I co-wrote it. He was, I was the student. He was definitely the teacher named Robert Heverly, who was uh, the primary uh, writer on the FBI and uh, was Sam Peckinpah's writing partner on The Westerner. And uh, Virgil Vogel was the director, but it just it just didn't go very far, unfortunately. I mean, we got paid to write the script and all that stuff. We did a lot of research, but no, it just they didn't uh, it didn't go. I know they offered it to Peter Strauss of all people, and he would have been uh, working under a makeup. But let's talk about um, I guess his legacy. Throughout the years, there have been many. Uh, different homages to uh, Rondo, but I think the most famous one, Court, 
was in the, the Rocketeer and uh, Little Rondo. You want to tell us about that? When uh, Danny Bilston and Paul DeMeo wrote the screenplay, of course, they had to include uh, Little Rondo. And Rick Baker was just absolutely thrilled to be able to create a Rondo Hatton makeup. I remember when I saw the movie and suddenly there's Rondo Hatton stomping across the screen. It was just delightful. I, I thought it was wonderful. I and it was very hip. Right. No, I meant Tiny Ron. Tiny Ron. Not little Rondo, <laughs> but uh, same thing. And then uh, it's just a great homage. I think I have a photo of the guy who played him. There's Tiny Ron. Yep. So, I mean, that's just masterful. Uh, he got him down perfect. And it, yeah, it was a surprise to see that. Um, but as I said, just a great homage. And there's been other things that have come out. I think there was a documentary we called what Rondo and Bob or something like that. Uh, Court. That's about his relationship with uh, his old buddy who was still uh, working for the uh, Tampa Tribune. Right. I, and, that, that's uh, also a great kind of a. I don't know if it's a mock documentary, but it's kind of half bio doc, half documentary, and half fantasy. Yeah, uh, it, it is, and no, but it, it's really neat. Again, I one of my favorite references to Rondo Hatton is in an episode of the Rockford Files. And James Garner's trying to b bolster uh, the confidence of a guy that he knows he's been in prison with and the th guy thinks he's not going to ever make it with any women. And so Jim Rockford says, look, you're no Rondo Hatton. I think you've got just a <laughs> perfect chance as anybody does. It's wonderful. I just it, And for that period, absolutely nobody knew what the, what the hell are they talking about. Yeah, but there it was. You'd have to so Jim, of... Jim Rockford likes Rondo Hatton, and that ought to do it for everybody. Right. You never know what you'd hear on a 70s cop show, huh, Court? Yep. And then let's fast forward. I think, is it, um, what year was the Rondo first uh, introduced? And tell us about it, what it is and what it stands for. Oh, the, the Rondo Awards? Gosh, well, it's David Colton is the one who initiated them, and he had Cary Gamble design the award itself, which is completely based on the sculpture bust, that beautiful uh, prop from House of Horrors. And uh, what does it signify? I, I mean, I mean, I know if you're a monster kid or you write uh, in the genre or if you made a film, it honors different categories, right? Well, it does. It really is kind of the achievement for horror, science fiction and fantasy uh, who are you know, what creators have made the most impact during the year. Uh, they also honor uh, special features on Blu-rays and film restoration and just kind of really, you know, go out and look at the genre itself and who has done a great deal to preserve it and also what the new accomplishments are. And yeah. uh, I, can, I can say that I've been uh, involved with, well, two that won uh and i don't know with the other nominations and stuff these are all these things that like i've written or so you, you or have whatever. a rondo really about, you have it about 10. court you have nope. a rondo oh nope i don't know those those go to uh those go to dan griffith at ballyhoo and most deservedly so because uh you know it's his car he does the uh he does all the heavy lifting. We won one uh, just this past year for uh, Jack Arnold at Universal, his best uh, supplement on uh, on a Blu-ray release. And that was right. for The Incredible Shrinking Man at Criterion. So that's cool. So I guess that kind of ends our uh, take and our homage and our uh, tribute to Rondo Hatton. And so I hope all of you fans uh, of uh, Rondo enjoyed it, our, our Rondo cast. And we try to cover his films. We try to give you tidbits, personal information, uh, stuff that you might have not known about, and maybe stuff you already knew about. But we just wanted to make it fun. And I don't, I don't, I don't think any podcast has done a visual uh, tribute to him, Court. So I think it was about time that you know that uh, we bring his name out and give him his proper due, because he's just, as I said, a legendary actor. Uh, as limited as he was in his acting ability, he still had a screen presence, uh, whether he was built up or not with fake padding. 
that is second to none. I mean, he was a giant of a man, even though he really wasn't a, a giant. It's it's Rondo's world. I just kind of we just live in it, right? Right, Corey. Yes. So anyway, uh, let's get to uh, we at the end of every show. We kind of do a change of pace. It's kind of like an after dinner mint. After we do like a big show on somebody, we like to do our memorabilia section. And last week, as you know, we covered uh, the Castle Film Catalog, and you showed off some of your great Universal Castle films. But today, I'm excited to go over uh, Monster Magazines, the great uh, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And of course, the, the granddaddy of them all is Famous Monsters of Filmland uh, by Forey Ackerman. And, oh, yes. uh, and yeah, and um, I'm going to Dr. Little... Acula. Right. <laughs> Dr. Acula. Dracula? No, Dr. Acula. So I'm going to give a little uh, background first on uh, how it all started. If I can find my notes. Okay. Uh, let's put it up on the screen. It all started way back when, Court, when uh, Shock Theater uh, played on TV. Um, and back in the 60s, kids uh, didn't have to wait to October to celebrate Halloween because of all the movies being sold to television in the 50s. So, uh, you know, there was a glutton of monster mags in the 60s. So it was Halloween all year long for, for uh, monster kids. Uh, a package of old 30s and 40s universal horror movies were sold to television stations under the name Shock Theater. Uh, so soon, every, every state was showing their versions of it uh, with their own personal horror host. And um, I see if I have an advertisement for it here. Let me see. Uh, here we go. I guess for the Invisible Ray. And uh, it was on Friday nights at 11.30. Um, and it was so popular that I guess they followed up with Super Shock. Uh, and this was the only time you hadn't, there was no, I mean, there were no VHS and they, they really didn't play on TV. So this was the first time in history, and it is a famous thing, where Shock Theater reintroduced all these great classic horror films uh, to a, uh, a new generation. But then how did the monster magazines um, um, come out of this? Uh, well, kids uh, couldn't see enough of this court. So... Um, I guess uh, the publishers wanted to make a quick buck, so they decided, let's why not put a monster magazine out uh, that would be at drugstores, at newsstands, a bookshop, any place that sold, a malt shop that sold magazines. And it kicked off, of course, uh, with famous monsters. Of, I mean, it wasn't the first, but it's the one that was uh, the first one on the map. And I guess I'll be putting these uh, in the middle of, at least this one in the middle of us, just to show it off here. And um, there's issue one. Right. And uh, 1958. And from there, they came hard and fast. A lot of magazines lasted a few issues, some only one. But Famous Monsters well, lasted well into the 80s, 90s and 2000s. And uh, it had some great covers, great stories, great articles. And it, they reviewed horror films. And Forey loved reviewing Lon Chaney movies. And it was just a fun magazine. So before I get to the others, and we do kind of a countdown, Court, why don't you show some of your uh, copies that you have? Well, in fact, I wish, you know, I, I've i always wanted to do the upgrade, but I think kind of got stuck in the reader's copy type world because that's what I could afford. So here is issue number one without a cover. Right, right. But it meant that I, uh, you know, paid like five bucks for this a million <laughs> years ago. So... And uh, in fact, the first 20 issues uh, of FM I have, I have a pretty complete run, are here in uh, a series of these uh, original notebooks. And when you talk about the covers, oh, good Lord, look, I opened up to uh, one of my all-time favorites. It's just gorgeous. Uh, there is, uh, say it's hard for me to see. There's Gorgo. Right. Just terrific. And uh, Basil Gogas, of course, being the champion. Oh, look, it's a fear book. And this is, uh, here you go, uh, from our first six issues. There, right, yeah, there, I remember those there yearbooks. Yep, yeah. and, uh, uh, of course, oh, I love this. On the back here, of course, Famous Monsters was going to be the place. Of <coughs> This is wonderful. That's the Outer Limits. Robert Culp. And then uh, here on the back, up oh, there we go. 
You can uh, order that court. The, you bet. Those wonderful posters. And naturally, we all drooled over the Don Post calendar masks and all the rest of it. But the thing is, Famous Monsters really was, you know, Forey Ackerman was the public figure of the magazine. James Warren, of course, was the publisher and the man responsible for so much of the content. So it was it was an interesting thing. Well, Warren made the choice to go into business with Ackerman because he knew Forey had the science fiction, fantasy, and horror, uh, if you will, uh, profile. That he could connect with the conventions, he could connect with the young readers. Uh, he became Uncle Forey to generations. And, you know, now and you can see all this crazy stuff in here in the other room. My God, forget it. Uh, growing up in the 1960s as part uh, of the monster boom, it's like unless somebody experienced it, it really seems like we're talking, uh, speaking a foreign language. Because shock theater on television, new horror films from Hammer and American International uh, in the theaters, model kits, coloring books, masks. As you said, it was Halloween every day. It just didn't stop. And of course, there was no VHS. There was no home video. So that's where the Castle films came in, which you could order from the back of Famous Monsters and everything else. But it was this like nuclear explosion of horror. And there was FM which under Warren's insistence kind of slanted its articles and things towards younger readers. And for he loved his puns and, you know, Harwood, California and all that stuff. So there was FM, but then Jay would go, then though, if you were buying famous monsters, you also probably wanted to buy castle of Frankenstein. And, right. So I'm going to, you know, yeah, I'm going to show and, some right now. Here are some of the, uh, some of the uh, there's the first few ones was that there was a black zoo uh, magazine and the brave ghouls and uh, cinema 57 which actually cinema 57 is what four used um, kind of as an inspiration to do that to do to, to do famous monsters and so let's see if I can show them here okay castle of Frankenstein was you know, the Famous Monsters had kind of opened up the marketplace, but Castle of Frankenstein was a much more serious and scholarly magazine. That was Calvin T. Beck, and Joe Dante was one of the writers for the magazine. And it was, it was a different approach to this subject matter. And they also had a lot of interviews with people. And Jim Warren apparently didn't really like to do interviews. He felt that the age group for the readership of Famous Monsters was a little young to understand what Edward Van Sloan or someone like that had to say about anything. Although, before he did keep doing it, uh, it would be snuck in. But Castle of Frankenstein always wanted to do interviews with filmmakers. And uh, that was, uh, again, much more of a journalistic approach to... Uh, uh, to monsters and to horror rather than, if you will, with the jokes and the puns that became uh, so much a part of the delightful formula of Famous Monsters, which was uh, just a monolithic success. Okay, well, these this is when everything kind of just went basically nuclear for... Uh, uh, for monster magazines and you'd go into the drugstore and they would just be they would just be absolutely everywhere this curse of frankenstein horror of dracula double was in fact published by warren and was available through famous monsters and they are uh film books of both movies done with stills and uh thought balloons and dialogue balloons throughout so you're literally reading the movie like a comic book right Fantastic Monsters of the Films was, uh, that was the offshoot of the uh, incredible work of uh, Paul Blaisdell and uh, Bob Burns, who was started their own uh, monster magazine. And they wanted to do something, again, that was more, if you will, literate and definitely emphasizing behind the scenes because Paul Blaisdell was the great special effects man behind It Conquered the World and The She-Creature and uh, Not of This Earth and all those wonderful American International movies. And that was uh, his creation, that magazine. And unfortunately, that magazine, which is wonderful and back issues are 
real prized possessions. Uh, that went under because the printers had a fire, which they now think was just an insurance scam, but uh, wiped out the magazine, wiped out its uh, opportunity. Now, For Monsters Only was one of the magazines that would traditionally just take, would take stills from old uh, horror movies and then add funny captions and balloons and things like that. Uh, and every once in a while you'd see something really cool in there. I had a, an issue with, um, I want to say a Grey Morrow cover that was really startling with them with an ape and uh but uh it was it was definitely kind of a little more geared towards the fun and games and then they would intersperse that with uh with uh serious articles horror monsters uh, was really built i it seems to me uh out of publicity materials that was issued uh for movies that were either playing on shock theater or new packages that were being sold to television or what was in the movie theater so the studios of course were always sending out new in new photographs and new written material and whatever and horror monsters always struck me as just kind of being the place where all that stuff was kind of pasted together and there was always the problem of repeating material from magazine to magazine because how much are you going to be able to write about the mummy's curse? You know, it's there. There was kind of a a repetition there, unless you were covering uh, new uh, movies. Horror at Party Beach was another one of the Warren run one-offs. Uh, that uh, the double of horror, uh, horror of Dracula and Curse of Frankenstein, and then uh, also the Mole People, and all three of those were were available. Now here is okay. Journal of Frankenstein is, in fact, the very first of uh, Castle of Frankenstein. That was how it was originally uh, marketed. So that was Calvin T. Beck and, uh, again, a very scholarly, interested approach to, uh, to horror. Mad Monsters was another, I always loved that cover, but it was another uh, magazine that kind of emphasized more comedy captions and things like that, that... Uh, and then interspersed with uh, ser serious articles. Uh, Modern Monsters, uh, that was a short-lived uh, little magazine. They, they would do, you know, again, the uh, retro articles about things and then try and catch up with if there was, in fact, any new horror playing in the theaters, whether it was Dracula AD 72 or what have you. Monster Mania, I loved because the layouts and everything else in it were very, very superior. And look at this, an interview with Jack Pierce, a uh, thing about Rasputin the Mad Monk, the Peter Cushing story. That was a, that, that magazine really had the goods. And if you were really seriously interested, also too, it wasn't just being interested in, in movie, in monsters, it was being interested in movies and making movies. So. Any one of these magazines that would print a still of Jack Pierce making up Lon Chaney Jr. or some behind the scenes photograph from The Bride of Frankenstein or something, which Famous Monsters did an awful lot of. Oh my gosh, that was just like mana from heaven to be given the opportunity to see that stuff because it just wasn't, it wasn't available to us. It wasn't snap your fingers and go online or anything. That didn't exist. So we relied on these magazines. Monster World, of course, had the bizarre history because it was started as a sister magazine to Famous Monsters to appear in the months where Famous Monsters was not published. Uh, what happened was they just decided to fold the Monster World run, which I believe was 10 issues, maybe 12, uh, into the run of Famous Monsters of Filmland. So Famous Monsters of Filmland skipped that number of issues and just said, well, Monster World was the same thing. It was all of us once again. So yeah, it's just, uh, we're just going to have it uh, here. But they wanted to, uh, you know, make sure that there was some Warren publication monster magazine on the newsstands uh, 12 months out of the year. And Monsters Unlimited. Again, another, let's do the funny captions. There's Lon Chaney from The Mummy's Tomb. And uh, it was it was a fun, uh, Monsters Unlimited was the magazine you bought at the beach. Right. If you couldn't find uh, anything else. Now, Spacemen 
was the magazine, again, Jim Warren, and they wanted to cover science fiction, really trying to divide the genres so that, uh, and Ackerman was very involved with science, science fiction. His wife was involved with the paperback series, Perry Rodin. And so they said, well, let's have a forum just for science fiction. It has nothing to do with Wolfman or universal horror. And that was uh, Spaceman. And it, uh, it was short lived, uh, but uh, it was a very, very good magazine. And it um, uh, was also able to cover current events because, of course, this was at the time when we were in the space race to uh, get to the moon. So that was this was something that was on a lot of people's minds, and it wasn't just uh, just for the movies. The Werewolves and Vampires. Uh, I think that looks like a one-off from maybe Erie Publications. I think that's right. And I've actually never seen that magazine. Creatures was another one that I think was, uh, they were, uh, or I should say world famous creatures, uh, was a magazine that, again, they were trying to go for a slightly more scholarly approach. Uh, lots of uh, great photographic images, and that cover from Curse of the Demon is just, I think, wonderful. Right. And last but not least, I'd be remiss if we didn't mention the Monster Times Court. Oh, the Monster Times. The Monster Times. What's cool about the Monster Times is that it arrived uh, when famous monsters and I mean, Castle of Frankenstein was kind of, you know, gotten very sporadic and famous monsters. And remember, too, this was all before the introduction of Fangoria. So everything was kind of sputtering out because the interest in the old Universal horror movies and whatever was going on in American International was starting to subside, at least on the magazine front. And Warren was, of course, emphasizing Vampirella, Eerie, and Creepy and all their black and white magazines, which Marvel also had stepped in and started to do. So it was, it was really a battle between photo-driven magazines and comic-driven magazines. And then here comes the Monster Times, printed like a newspaper, and it was hip. It had a poster inside and it looked at old movies. It looked at new movies. Hey, here's an interview with Christopher Lee. This is what Hammer is doing. Here's something about Godzilla. Here's a great picture of Ingrid Pitt. They were, they were terrific. And they were also uh, being distributed to schools. I used to get mine at a record store in downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, and kind of one of the big secrets about the monster times was it was published by al goldstein who published screw that's why the format was the newspaper format and they kept that very very under wraps because uh school libraries looked at the monster times and said you know something this is a lot of fun and it will get kids to read which it did so the origin or where where the checks were coming from was something that absolutely nobody was supposed to know about until, of course, after it uh, went out of business. Right. So that is our look at monster magazines of the 50s and 60s. So, Court. Uh, the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg, right. I, there's probably another another dozen I could have shown, but those are the, the ones that I thought uh, had the most influence, at least from my research. And uh, I mean, there's Eerie and Vampirella uh, and some other ones as well. But uh, anyway, Court, great uh, info as always. And uh, Court and I look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, and until then, I always say stay scared. And I think Boris is going to take us out again or Dr. Neiman will. So join us next time on Professor Lampini's podcast of horrors. So long. So long. Thank you for joining us on Professor Lampini's Podcast of Horrors. Join us next time when we'll cover other topics like Universal Horror, Poverty Row, and profiles on people like Bela Lugosi, John Carradine, Peter Laurie, and even on myself. Until next time, stay scared. Stay scared.